Good morning. Good morning. We have a handful of announcements this morning. We are kind of at the end of the month lull on things, except it's not really much of a lull this month. Prayer group is going to meet here at the church on, no, nope. prayer group is back at Jean's house this week. No videos and no popcorn, which may diminish attendance. I don't know. We'll see. Um, um, next Sunday is when we're going to celebrate All Saints Sunday, properly November 1st, but I didn't want to wait until the 6th. Um, so part of our routine in that is to read the names of the saints who have died in the past year. We'll start with those who were members of this congregation, and then I will invite you to bring whatever names you have. Um, and we'll read all of those um, during that part of the service to remember those who have died in the past year. Um, several of us were commenting before the service that it seems like the list has gotten longer this year than normal, um, but we will take however long it takes to do that. So please be thinking about those names and that list. Um, the next week is the first week in November. Yes, somehow that's happened. Um, and so November 1st is that Tuesday, and I'm going to assume the prayer group is going to meet at Jean's house. That Friday, the 4th, we have a Red Cross blood drive here at the church. So if you are eligible to give and willing to give, either sign up online or talk to Susie about how to make that happen. Um, Sunday, November 6th is time change. So be ready to fall back for that. Um, and then as we get into to November proper, more things will appear on the calendar, and you'll hear about some of those later on in the service as well. Do we have other announcements this morning? Hearing none, let's worship God. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Please join me in the call to worship. Unbutton our lips, dear God. We'll let loose with your praise. Going through the motions doesn't please you. A flawless performance is nothing to you. We learned, we learned God worship when our pride was shattered. Heart shattered lives ready for love. Don't for a moment escape God's notice. Make Zion the place you delight in. Repair Jerusalem's broken down walls. Then you'll get real worship from us. Acts of worship small and large. Come, let us worship the Lord. Our hymn of praise is number 451.
The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely clean of my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Because I know my wrongdoings, my sin is always right in front of me. I've sinned against you, you alone. I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you render your verdict completely correct when you issue your judgment. Yes, I was born in guilt, in sin, from the moment my mother conceived me. And yes, you want truth in the most hidden places. You teach me wisdom in the most secret space. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilty deeds. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated and Gala has a minute for mission for us this week. And it's funny. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the Blessing Box mission. Um, we purchased about $350 worth of food two months ago now and it's almost all gone. So uh, please keep the blessing box in your thoughts when you go to the grocery store, you know, a couple cans of this, a couple cans of that, uh, so that we can keep that replenished. Our second phase of the blessing box mission is a winter coat or winter clothing really giveaway that we have scheduled for November 19th. So what we're looking for are used, clean <laughs> coats, um, gloves, Hat, stock hats, uh, socks, uh, just warm clothing, any size, any gender um, that we can put in there. Here's, here's the challenge with that. We need to start advertising it. So we want to take it to the Promise, the Soup Kitchen, our sign, um, you know, in different places in the community. However, we need to make sure we can support it because we surely don't want to advertise something like that and then have two coats in there. Plus, we don't know who's going to show, if anyone will show. It's really a trial run. Um, November 19th will be open. I'm thinking maybe 8 to 12 type thing. Um, and just to see if anyone shows if, and if there's a need. And if there's not, we'll think of something else. So if you think you have some coats in your closet that you're not wearing, I know I surely do. Um, please bring them in. And if you could let me know if you think you do, that might help us decide if we can start advertising this in the next week. All right, thank you very much.
change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart. you haven't read ahead, some of our selections may not make sense yet, but we have skipped a little bit in time and space from last week. We were with Joshua last week, and we have moved several generations beyond that. We have moved into the land. The judges have ruled over the land. The people have decided they wanted a king just like everybody else. Samuel the prophet has argued vehemently against that and actually been overruled by God. Um, they have gotten a king named Saul, who was crazy. He was literally described in scripture as chewing on the furniture. Um, and Saul has gotten replaced by David, who is David of David and Goliath, David of the Psalms, um, David of being a man after God's own heart. And today we're going to read the passages that make all of that challenging. So we start in the 11th chapter. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house. They saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Then when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent her and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our next hymn is 518, Lamb of God.
You may be seated. We're going to pick up then in the 12th chapter. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He brought it up and it grew up with him and his, with his children. He used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So there's a couple pieces to this story, and I warned the Sunday school class that if I preached on the whole story, we'd get out of here at about 1.30. So I'm not going to preach the whole story. First of all, for anybody who says they don't let their kids read something because there's sex and violence in it, this passage tells us that they should be avoiding scripture as well. Secondly, there is a trait in many of us that we see in David when we read scripture. And that is, as believers, we often read ourselves into the good guy role. How many of you read this passage as though you're David? Maybe Nathan? Maybe an observer? We read the Good Samaritan, and, you know, we want to be the Good Samaritan, not the robbers. We read the story, and we want to put ourselves in the place of the people of Israel when they're good, but man, when they get it wrong, we just don't understand how anybody could be that dense. Surely we're not that dense, are we? And so what we have here is David being very, very, very human. And this passage creates problems for us because David is so very human. He is a hero. He is legendary. He is the one whose house is always going to be on the throne. He has a covenant with God. The Messiah is going to come out of his house. David is a really big deal. We tell our kids about David and Goliath, and frankly, every sports season, somehow there's a David who slays a Goliath. It's penetrated our cultural language. We remember the anointing of David as king. We trace his lineage back to Ruth. We remember that he plays musical instruments to soothe Saul, the savage beast. And we attribute most of the Psalms, where many of us turn in times where we need comfort, to David as the writer. He is a bigger-than-life figure and he is the protagonist in this story. So it starts off already with a backhanded comment about David's behavior. It is the spring of the year when kings go off to war, and David is not off to war. David has sent people, he sent his armies, he sent Joab as his general, but David is not off to war. David is just hanging out in Jerusalem. The, the, the Hebrew word is actually the word for sitting. So it says he remained and it's actually sitting. 
And then you'll catch that when we move into the action of the story, did you catch when he's getting up off his couch? In the late afternoon, when the king arises for the day, what do we say to teenagers who arise in the late afternoon? Right. And so then he goes up on his roof and he looks out over things because he's got the highest place. And a lot of our artwork over the years has portrayed Bathsheba as being on her roof. The text doesn't actually say that. And I would invite you to consider if you would haul water with no indoor plumbing all the way up to the roof to take a bath. And David sees her and David thinks she's gorgeous. And David decides he needs to have her. So he tries to figure out who she is. And she is named here, but she's also named in a very odd way because she's named as being both of her father, Eliam, and of her husband, Uriah. And she's given her name. She doesn't get to do much in this story. She doesn't get to say anything. We never hear a word from Bathsheba's perspective. So imagine, if you will, what happens next when David sends people to go get her from her door. Think about how that could, could play out, right? Imagine right now how that would play out in China. Xi Jinping says, come. Am I ever coming back? Right? We don't know if it's servants of the palace. We don't know if it's soldiers. We don't know who David is sending. And we don't know really how she responds or what she thinks. But I would invite you to think about that part of this story. She gets back to the palace. David lies with her. She gets pregnant. The part we skipped has David conniving after he finds out she's pregnant. So his first thought is, let me get Uriah back here on a weekend furlough from the battlefields, and he can lie with his wife, and then everybody will think it's his. Uriah, the Hittite, the non-Hebrew, the non-Israelite, says, no, I can't do that. My, my companions are out here in the field. I, it's not right for me to do that. David's first plan is scratched. David's second plan does come to fruition. He tells Joab and the other generals, just put Uriah in the front lines. And when he gets into trouble, just pull back and let him die. We started counting and got to at least three commandments that David had broken just in about 15 verses. Three of the top 10, as a matter of fact. And, uh, that's kind of when we get to Nathan's entry into the story. Nathan is a prophet. He is kind of the prophet. He is the successor to Samuel. He's going to have to tell David no again later in the story where uh, David says, hey, let me build God a house. And Nathan is the one who goes, well, first Nathan goes, yes. And then God comes to, to Nathan and says, no. And then Nathan goes back to David and says, no. Um, and so Nathan comes to David, and again, we don't have a ton of the setting, but it seems like David is alone, or at least as alone as you get to be if you're king. And Nathan tells him a parable. It's one of our earliest parables, really, in Scripture. It sounds a lot like the other parables. We have a lot of parables where, for instance, a man has two sons. That's the prodigal son. We have a lot of parables where there's a choice between A and B. Um, and we have a lot of stories coming up to this where there's two sons, two men um, in the story. And so that, that part would be kind of familiar. There's a rich man and there's a poor man. One has a lot, one has a little. And Nathan keeps on telling the parable. The rich man has a guest. The rich man doesn't want to use any of his stuff to host the guest. So he goes and gets the poor man's lamb. Doesn't say he pays for it. 
just as he goes and gets it. And that gets David up in arms. He is, his anger is kindled. That's that great image of anger is fire. His anger is kindled. As long as the Lord lives, this man should die for this. And he should have to repay it four times over because he robbed him and he had no pity. Step out of this story for a moment. Let's go to the parable of the sower. Y'all remember the parable of the sower? Sower's walking along, scattering seed on the ground. How many of us think that we're the rocky ground? Right? How many of us want to be the stuff in the weeds? How many of us want to be fertile ground? Right? Okay, so that, that is kind of this challenge here. David is seeing himself as the poor man. Very humanly, he's seeing himself as the poor man. We like an underdog story, don't we? That's why it's fun to hate on the Yankees. We like an underdog story. And then Nathan delivers the line, perhaps, of David's reign. You are the man. I kind of imagine him pointing a finger. You are the man, not the good, you are the man, the bad, you are the man. And then he has a word of God, word from God for David. I anointed you king. I rescued you from Saul. I gave you riches and wealth. I gave you two nations to rule over. And if that wasn't enough, I would have given you that much again. And you had to go and do this thing. And the way, the way God lays it out is that David both killed Uriah by the sword, killed, killed him with violence, and then stole his wife, and then killed him by the sword of the Ammonites. So God is really ticked off about this killing thing. It's easier, right, to read ourselves as the aggrieved party or the part that we think is going to come out on top. It's not always faithful, though. I think, honestly, when we look back on, for instance, the parable of the sower, we can find times in our lives where we have been parched, hard ground that the word could not fall on and penetrate. And we have been the weeds and the brambles as well, letting life strangle the good news out of us. And there have been times when we have been fertile soil, but it's not always that we're fertile soil. We read the story of the people of Israel like we've done this fall, and we want to celebrate the exodus we want to celebrate God's deliverance. We want to celebrate faithfulness. We want to laugh a little bit about how troublesome and quarrelsome those people are in the wilderness. How they'd rather go back to Egypt than be free. Can't they see it? We don't want to talk about the fact that there are people in the land already when they get there and they go in and take it over. But to be the people of Israel, to be the people of God in the good parts of the story, we kind of have to be willing to be the people of God in the bad parts of the story too, right? Like we don't just get to suddenly go, oh, that's not us. That's not me. That's not us. That's not how this works. And so our challenge reading scripture is to have the Holy Spirit or somebody like Nathan come up and tap us on the shoulder every so often and say, you the man, and it's not a good thing. We go through life and we pick out good guys and bad guys. It's easy on the, the Westerns from the 40s. The good guy has a white hat and the bad guy has a black hat. And that's all you need to know. In reality, is it ever that simple? 
And so we have this challenge. Part of it is admitting who we are as, as the people of God. We are the beloved, called, chosen people of God. And we are the people of God who repeatedly fall short of the mark God has set for us. And it's not either or. It's not like on Tuesdays, I'm the good guy, and on Wednesdays, I'm the bad guy. It can change in a conversation. It can change in a heartbeat. And so we are all of that. And we need all of that to be reminded to us sometimes. Part of what Nathan does is retell the story of what God has been to David. Remember when Joshua did that last week to the people? Like this happens a lot in the Old Testament. And I think sometimes this is something we as Christians have forgotten how to do but we need to find a way to do it again. Who has God been to us? What has God seen us through? How have we been the people of God? We can talk about it, you know, as a congregation. We can talk about it as individuals. We can talk about it as families. We can talk about it as communities. Um, but we have to retell that part of the story and the whole part of the story which we're not really good at. I mean, I'm going to be honest. We talked in Sunday school about how long it has come for us as a nation to even start talking about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And yet this story is preserved in scripture, and we are talking about David's foibles. 3,000 years later? Wow. The story is in there for a reason. It offsets some of the David worship. It offsets some of the, the perfectness of David and the wondrousness of David. And it's a reminder to all of us that we don't just get to hear the parables and be the heroes. We have to imagine that we could be the other side of the coin, the other side of a piece of paper that we could be the black hat in the story. Our challenge, of course, is to do better than that. We're not always good at that. And so when we tell these stories, we tell the stories of who we are as the people of God, we have to have more powerful conversations. So one of the conversations that is ranging like this, just in the Presbyterian church and in the Christian churches, just in North America, just in North America, is the story of residential schools for Native Americans. At the time, the way it was couched, the way it was phrased, is that we were bringing them salvation and enlightenment and abuse and pain and loss and death. And now when we look back, we can't tell that story the way we used to tell that story, but somebody had to tap us on the shoulder and say, um, that ain't really how it happened, David. Presby's, Methodists, Catholics, Lutherans. We have presbyteries and synods throughout the country that are making reparations for being built on the labor of slaves. We have congregations and presbyteries handing land back to Native Americans. We have this odd story that only comes when there's some accountability, when somebody has tapped us on the shoulder and said, you're the man. You're the man. Are we going to be perfect going forward? No way. Not a snowball's chance in you know where. At the same time, we stand a better chance of doing better. Psalm 51 is sort of David's response to all this, and it's problematic. Because it's just about him and God. It's just about all the things he did wrong between him and God. But who else did he impact? Bathsheba, right? Uriah? Eliam, who's got to wonder what's going on with his daughter? From here, 
God will curse David and it ends up being more of a curse on Bathsheba, in my opinion. And she's going to lose that child. That child is going to die. Later, she'll have more kids with David and David will name her his beloved wife. Imagine being Bathsheba living in the palace. Just imagine that dynamic. And next week, we'll read about their favorite child, Solomon. But David's life goes rapidly downhill from here. He goes from being the war hero and the musician and the king and the king of legend to being one whose own sons want to kill him to take the throne, to running and hiding, to losing people he loves dearly. His life really falls apart after this moment. And let's be honest, as people of faith, we know people, we've been people whose life has fallen apart. Part of our challenge is to carry that as part of the story as well. If David just remains perfect little David, right? What does it seem like? Well, it seems like you got power, you get away with anything. God loves you, it'll all be fine. How many of us still believe that one? And so our lesson from this incredibly convoluted, involved story is to read as though we could be any role in the stories of Scripture, to find ourselves and to allow ourselves to be the bad guy, because sometimes we are. And to take that and let us lead us into something new. It's why we confess sin every week. It's why we ask for forgiveness every week. It's why we say the assurance of pardon every week. It's both needed, it's hopeful, it's powerful, and we forget it an awful lot. To God alone be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. Friends, our affirmation of faith today is the Apostles' Creed. Join me as we affirm what it is that we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Friends, let us respond to the good news heard and proclaimed by giving of our tithes and talents and beginning to gather our prayers together before God. Let us give and receive our morning offering. Amen.
may be seated. Friends, we bring not just our tithes and offerings before God, but the gifts of our entire lives, our hopes, our fears, our wonder, our awe. Um, Prayer-wise, um, Marion Medical Missions volunteers finished up this week and should be in transit back. This week was, this year was one team, four weeks. Uh, the goal was still that nearly impossible 3,500 wells, and I don't have a account from Tom yet on that, but he and Jocelyn will be coming back in the next couple of weeks, as they always do with a little bit of delay um, from that trip. So continue to pray for that work. Um, the original plan for the year, you know, Tom always has an original plan. And we always get to like plan number Q by the time we get done, was just to be in Malawi. But the need was great enough and the volunteers were great enough, and the circumstances changed enough that there were wells installed in Malawi, in Tanzania, and in Zambia this year. So again, um, covering a wide swath of territory. Again, not going the way we think it's going to, but it goes the way it needs to. Um, what else do you want to lift up today? Do we have other prayer requests this morning? <laughs> Will you pray with me? God, we come to you because we have been told the stories of the things you have done. And we have experienced you at work in the world. And we have hope that we will see you at work in the world yet again and more. We come to you because we are your people. Sometimes faithful, sometimes less than faithful. And yet we are still your people your beloved, your children. And so we come to you. We come to you with our prayers for successful medical procedures, for safe travel, for comfort for those who grieve and mourn, for those who live in out-of-the-way places and who struggle to have what they need each day of their lives. God, we come to you this day with both thanksgiving on our minds, hope in our hearts, and an unsureness about what will come next. We ask you to walk with us and guide us into the next things. Be with us. Lead our hearts and our hands in all the places we need to go, all the people we need to see. We pray this as you taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, our hymn of sending today is number 438, Rock of Ages.
friends, as we go out, it's hard to say go out and take this story with you because it's one we normally want to skip. Go out and find hope in a God who continues to work through far from perfect people. Go out and be the people of God, broken yet faithful, hopeful all the time. Go and may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen.